everyone. Welcome uh, to Chat with Traders Community. I'm your host, uh, Ian Cox. And today we have a follow-up guest, David Sun. Uh, he was first interviewed by Tessa on episode 248. And uh, back during that time, we were in a period of higher volatility. Uh, and now volatility is much lower. And so, um, David, how are you doing in this time of uh, low volatility? It's 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 been pretty good actually. Uh, the markets, yeah, it's been wild this year. It's like uh, a lot of whipsaws, right? We had the January. It's like every single month, the bar, the monthly bar, was like opposite direction. So it's been really erratic. Um, but overall, you know, I think about as good as can be expected. Mm hmm. Um, I noticed a Twitter um, post that you put uh, back on December 1st uh, that you're trading short dated puts again. Um, could you explain that? Yeah. So I, throughout the last few years, um, have been working on a number of strategies, you know, just like the ones I touched upon in my podcast episode. And they range from different um, expiration cycles. You know, I was doing weeklies down to two to three days up to 90 days and I also do some zero DTE you get even if you trade the same type of strategy on the same instrument you know one would think they're correlated but there is actually quite a bit of uh diversification within expiration cycles right the same strategy applied at different cycles will have different equity curves um so that's an interesting thing to to keep in mind now I had moved to zero and 90 exclusively for some time because zero DTE, no overnight risk. 90 DTE has overnight risk, but it's more feasible to Black Swan Hedge. You get further, gamma's lower. <clears throat> so there's some benefits there. And I had cut out uh, the shorter data ones because it doesn't have any of those benefits. Right? You have the overnight risk and the gamma. And it's very hard to really have a proper Black Swan Hedge. <clears throat> At the time, I also had a core portfolio uh, in one of my funds anyway um, of just straight mar market index funds, right? That was just sort of like my core benchmark. Um, I recently changed that up because I didn't want that double exposure of having, if there's a 20% gap, right? Your stocks tank, your options tank, and then you kind of just, you know, double double the loss. So I, I, I changed that up recently, which, why, which was what allowed me to now revisit having, you know, so... I said in my recent podcast episode, it's not that the gap risk is gone. It's now I'm willing to accept it again because I've made some changes in other ways of my kind of portfolio construction. And I see. So I am trading short dated now one day or three day. Friday is three days because it's Friday to Monday, but every other day is like one DTE. I see. So, uh, so before, were you trading um, – pretty much exclusively uh, 90 days to expiration um, short S&P 500 puts. Is that correct? It was since about September of 2021. I look at my log later to see when I stopped it. But when I, when I cut out sort of that shorter dated, uh, so I do 90 and zero. Zero DTE is short, but it doesn't have overnight risk. So that's sort of like a totally different animal because that's almost like day trading in a sense. What I didn't want at the time was having overnight gap risk, but also not being able to, also taking on the gamma, right? When you do zero DTE, the gamma is there for sure, but you don't have the gap. So you at least take one kind of risk off the table. Mm -hmm. uh, were you finding that um, uh, without doing these zero DTE uh, option strategies uh, that you were incurring um, uh, higher losses or your probabilities of profit were uh, impacted in any kind of negative way? Are you talking about the 90 DT specifically? Yeah, yeah, right. When you just focused in on that, because correct me if I'm wrong, were you doing, you were doing the 90 uh, DTE even when VIX was really low, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So I've been doing some longer ones. The, the the longer data was kind of 45 DT for a while. That evolved to 90 sometime around July of last year. But I back tested that back to 
2013, depending on which software, even some of them go back to like 2008, 2009. But uh, to answer your question, the win rate over a long period of time is pretty steady. But of course, it's going to change um, kind of, I don't know if you want to call it market regimes or market environments. It kind of clusters. So like with 90 DTE, I'm going to have overlapping positions, right? Up to 18, 20, 25 or so. And what you'll get is if there's a, a sudden big move, you'll kind of lose a bunch at one thing. The losses cluster. So that will kind of take a hit to your, to your win rate. But then over time, you build up a bunch of winners. So it almost kind of normalizes to that long-term expectancy. But I'm talking about, you know, eight to 10 year kind of time frame. In any one year time frame, it's going to be quite different depending on the year. Um, I'm going to take a look at my log real quick for this year, for example. And we can do a screen share a little later on. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, this year, the win rate is 71%, which because of that, this particular setup is a risk three to make one. What the slippage and everything, 71% is basically not break even. <laughs> it's, it's negative, uh -huh. which is fine. But the longer term win rate that I, I usually expect with this particular strategy is more around the 85 to 89%. So I kind of expect to kind of drift towards that. And, and again, all, all of the longer term studies that I've done have, have shown it to be fairly stable. I see. Uh, do you have you done any testing to know what your win rate uh, would be? Say, if we were in a much higher uh, VIX environment, I have. So, what you're gonna get is because when VIX is high, you get that second tailwind of contracting volatility. So, I had an episode, and I put together a study. I call it the Theta Engine Matrix. I call it Matrix because I was doing a bunch of enumerations of different parameters of the test and I also applied different filters. I applied like only trade this when certain moving averages, right? I forget if it's a short over the long, long, I don't do this very much. I did it for just to have the study, but I did different moving average crossover conditions. I did VIX environments. So yes, at a high VIX, you'll have a higher win rate. However, the thing that people may not think about is you're going to have a lower volume of trades because that environment is just not as common. And so you get this effect where you're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, where you're going to keep all the high probability trades, but you're going to throw out a bunch of other trades that would be winners if you just run it across all environments. So that's something that whenever I think if you're going to do testing or you want to try and develop a strategy or trying to find certain conditions, you have to be aware of that. Like if you did a study and then go, oh, high VIX. This is a 95% winner. It's so good. You have to still go back and test, you know, low VIX or all VIX just to get some context. I'm not to say that the counterfactual won't be better, but at least you'll know, hey, like if I run it all the time, my win rate's lower, but I'll just have more profit because I'm just trading more. So those little kind of nuances, um, especially if people want to get into testing, you have to think about considering kind of all the situations. Great. We have a question from Nishant. Uh, Nishant, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Hey, David. So, so far, I may be jumping in too early, but so far I've heard that you're primarily selling puts. Is that correct? Yes. For okay. the anything above zero DTE, we're primarily selling puts. That's correct. Okay. So, like, uh, I'm just curious, you know, this year is so tough. It's horrible year for trading, uh, especially the first six months. So, when markets start dumping and they just don't stop, you know, like, you know, you, you, you found out your criteria, VIX is high, time to sell puts, markets have fallen to some point, but then they start dumping and continue dumping and actually VIX start going higher and higher. So how do you handle a situation like that? So the kind of strategies I've run, which I call campaign style, which means I'm not kind of looking for specific opportunities per se, but more have multiple strategies that just run across all environments. But basically we use stops for all of our strategies. And so in that situation, you're gonna, you'll hit multiple stops most likely. So you'll lose money, but you're gonna not have that crazy drawdown and it depends on the sizing too. So one thing I want you to consider is 
when you use a stop or any kind of adjustment, right? People talk about like adjusting delta, right? So if you sell puts, you're long delta, which is why you don't want the market to go down. Now, if you want to adjust delta, like you basically, you know, if the market moves against you and your, your short puts, you're picking up a long delta, right? And one way to adjust is to, you want less long delta. So you want to add short delta. Now there's two ways to do it. You can sell calls against it, right? Tasty Trade does that sometimes. Or you can roll down your puts and roll them further out of the money, which reduces your, your long delta. The way I see it, and, and I kind of talked about this, you know, on the, the episode with Tessa is when I stop out and I kind of reestablish, I'm essentially rolling, right? So built into the mechanics of the stops is kind of this concept of delta hedging. That's, that's kind of baked into the mechanics. And, and that's one way to kind of reconcile because people hear about different mechanics, different ways to adjust, delta hedging, stopping, whatever. I'm trying to point out that in a way they can all kind of be interrelated. And one other interesting thing is um, people talk about like trend following or, or trade with a trend. When market's going up, you want to go long. Market's going short, you want to go short. You know, let's say the market's trending upwards and, you know, I'm selling puts, I'm hitting profits, taking them off, selling puts, you know, hitting profit. You're kind of trend following because you're, you're selling puts higher and higher, right? Now, one way to think about it, if the market's going down and you're hitting stops, when you hit a stop, what are you doing? You're buying. Now, in this case, we're buying to close the put, but the action itself is still buying a put. And what I'm saying is, what I'm trying to point out is buying a put is adding short delta. So you can almost think of using stops as a way to trend follow, but not to, unless you actually flat out go short and buy more puts, you're not going to get the profit of, of the market tanking, but you're essentially adding short delta. So stopping out of short puts is kind of a way of following the trend in your case, you're following a trend to risk off or right? getting out of that. So to answer your question of like, how do you deal with it? I, I think the mechanics of managing the risk naturally encapsulate all of that, right? Because you don't want to sit there and, and take that big loss and you know, the market yeah. moves against you. So, um, and you can address this question later also. I don't want to hijack your presentation, but so I am a directional trader too. So I'm always uh, long deltas. And when the market conditions are right, um, you know the my strategies generate a lot of money. But when you're constantly hedging, which is pretty much a requirement in 2022, your uh, profitability drops so much. So if you could just touch on that, how how have you, how has your profitability been affected by constantly hedging this year? So I can talk about, I actually made a change that, that I referred to, uh, in a portfolio that's constantly long Delta, you're going to, as you said, be kind of hedging and you're more trying to minimize losses during those down years. And you're almost trying to just survive and get through the opportunity to when the market's going up again. Now that's going to kind of feel painful because you're going to quote unquote, not make money, so to speak in those down years. But what that's going to really do for your net lick, you know, in the long term is because when you have a large drawdown, right, it's really kind of bad for compounding because like, you know, 10% drawdown takes, you know, 12 or 13% to get back to even a 50% drawdown. That's the extreme example. It takes hundred percent to get back to even by you minimizing a drawdown and you hedging, it's going to feel painful now, but you're basically, if you in fact stick with that long Delta kind of setup you're you're buying yourself time to get to that get to that hump right because if, if you can get through this hump and be down a little bit or even when the market's down so much when the market turns you're gonna basically profit from that right so you need to keep your right kind of on the long-term goal of that's just how a long delta portfolio is kind of expected to behave right in the bear market you're playing defense in the bull market you're you're kind of capitalizing on on all of that long delta right now uh, and, and referencing back to where I made a change uh, recently is dropping a static long delta exposure and more focusing on different either uncorrelated strategies or delta neutral types of strategies and combining those. And my focus recently, and maybe we'll touch, touch on this later, uh, is more about portfolio construction and putting together different assets or strategies that are uncorrelated. And so that I don't necessarily have to feel like 
these types of years, it's always kind of forcing my hand. I have to play defense or I have to hedge and I'm just treading water. So, but again, to answer your question, if that's the thesis that you've chosen to kind of set your portfolio as a long delta, like that's okay, but you just have to understand you're not going to expect to make or be as profitable, right? If you're not as profitable this year, that's that's kind of the expectation because of the way you, you've you structured your portfolio. But that's okay too. Uh, do you have a preferred volatility environment uh, for your strategy? Um, I would say just because of that, you know, everyone's taught like, high volatility is opportunity because the premiums are rich. You get further from the money. So it may be kind of just like a psychological benefit, but it feels safer when volatility is high. If if you can set up the proper trades where like say you get really far out of the money and you, you think you have that tailwind of volatility contraction. So my preference is kind of the higher volatility. Now, there is something to be said. Volatility, when it's high or implied volatility, it's high for a reason. So if it's super high, probably the markets can be wild and that's not necessarily safer, quote unquote, even. Um, but I, I I also do enjoy when the premiums are richer because I feel like I can get further from the money. That said, I, I, like I said before, like the strategies I set are usually kind of systematic and campaign style. So they're going to just keep running regardless of of the, the environment. I, I don't, I don't set my strategies up my there's no mechanics built in where i kind of shut them off or turn them on they, based on volatility mm -hmm. i see for your own personal account do you trade the same type of strategies or do you in this low iv environment do you trade any different types of strategies i don't have i don't trade personal accounts so ah. i have uh, the, the two funds that i run i trade those exclusively um and then the strategies uh, which I can go over a few of them. The ones I even share in my podcast and the ones we touched on in the episode I did with Tessa, they're kind of variations or they're, they're the same types of strategies. And really, I, I I meant to put them out there as kind of building blocks and people can take the ideas or even take the specific strategies themselves and kind of put them together or scale them to a size that you know suits your risk tolerance. Um, but to answer your question, like er everything... Pretty much everything I'm trading is out there. Like that that's what you see on the podcast, on my trading pages. The only ones I don't share are the zero DTE stuff because we automate that. So it's not really something replicable anyways. Um, but yeah, you know, what you see is what you get as far as what I put out. Oh, okay. Uh, you mentioned in your Twitter post uh, something about an ERN put strategy. Is that what we've that, been talking yes. about? Okay. Uh, that's one of them. So uh, I did a podcast. I don't know if uh, anyone familiar with kind of the fire movement or people who blog in that space. Uh, there's a guy, Karsten, who uh, ERN stands for early retirement now. And he actually kind of does a niche thing where he sells, he writes put options as part of his retirement portfolio. And um, he has a series of blog posts on his strategy and they were the ones originally that inspired me to do the shorter dated back then before the daily expirations it was a two to three dte expiration cycle and he's been doing it he's done the one dte now and because with the recent revitalization or relaunch of me doing the short dated ones i actually caught up with karsten he was a guest on my podcast i think yesterday actually um and so I actually just named this strategy after so that's the ERN put it's, it's named after, you know, his name, big urn or Papa urn. That's kind of his, his moniker. Um, but it, it's named after him and his blog. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing. Uh, for when we look at probabilities, um, when we pull up a strike prices of options on a stock or uh, index, and we look at the um, implied volatility and probability OTM, probability of out of the money. And that's supposed to be, from my understanding, that's supposed to be at expiration. For um, our more novice um, option investors, uh, can we know what the probability of touching or going in the money sometime during the option period is? Is there any way to find that out? I believe from a tasty trade segment at some point that the probability of touch is approximately double the delta. 
Uh-huh. Um, that's a rough one. Um, you have to go search that segment. I think depending on how long you have until expiration, that may change. But in my mind, that that was that's just the one that jumps off to my head. Um, that somebody somewhere along the way I read or heard that it's about double the delta. I see. So, yeah. uh, you're not aware of any um, uh, place where we can get that information as far as does it fluctuate? Um, is there an actual service that calculates uh, probability of touching? No, not not that I'm aware, anyways. And that, and and just because that's also not something I've looked into personally to use in terms of guiding my strategies and the mechanics. Okay, great. Uh, isn't the um, when we so when we look at probability? So for right now, for example, uh, on the S and P five hundred, I'm looking at uh, as just an example the four hundred december put and right now it's showing at about 31.7 percent probability of being out of the money at expiration uh roughly roughly two to three weeks from now uh isn't that probability is that i mean some investors may look at these different probabilities and say oh this is great you know it you know i found xyz stock and it has an 80 percent probability of of not going in the money. And so I'll sell, sell that option, click some nice premium. But isn't that based on the implied volatility at the moment? And if the implied vol, if the investor does not check the implied volatility, they could uh, mistakenly uh, get sucked into a trade that seems so attractive based on the probabilities, but the implied volatility is near the bottom end of the range and just a, a, a reversion to the mean could very well mean that that probability shrinks down drastically and um, possibly ending in a you know losing trade just from implied volatility um, mean reversion. So a couple of things to keep in mind. You're right. That delta, all of the things about the Greeks, all of those metrics, it's a snapshot, right? And that delta is in fact always changing. But if you kind of think about it like, you enter the trade and there's a certain probability. Time goes on, the market moves, volatility changes, whatever. You're right. At that point in time, the probability has changed. But the probability that you are measuring is at the time of entry. Now, the thing is, like, if some investor just willy-nilly does one put and thinks that he should get that outcome, right? Because, Mary, it's not deterministic. You have to think probabilistically. If you were to sell, you know, one put every day, and look at the delta and keep track of the percentages of that it actually ends in the money, it's quite accurate. Um, some of these backtest tools that I've built on my website, they allow you to like set a stop or have no stop, set different deltas. And what we found is like, as soon as you turn off the stops and you pick a certain delta, my backtest tool will tell you like the win rate, right? And how often it ends in the money. And those win rates are very, very close. We've done this in the 2 to 3 DT range. We've done it in the 7 DT range, the 0 DT range. That delta is quite accurate as far as the percent chance and the money. Now, having said that, I've said this as well, focusing on the win rate isn't the end-all and be-all because people only want to focus win rate and not on how much you can lose, right? So yes, you have 90% chance of being out of the money. 10% 10% chance of being, okay, let, let's call it 95%, right? 5% chance of being in the money. Okay, so what? Like when that 5% happens, what is your loss, right? And it's very hard to measure that because the the win rate and the probability is just the probability of in the money. It's not telling you the probability of in the money by a dollar, $10, $100, right? So yes, the delta and the probability is actually a fairly accurate proxy as far as I know and I've tested, but that, shouldn't be the only thing you focus on anyways, because if you just sell it and, and you just have no stop, like that could easily end up being a 50X, 100X loser, depending on the amount of credit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I see. Uh, uh, when it comes to buying power, often I've noticed when I've sold options uh, that the amount of buying power required for different stocks or even indices varies drastically. Do you know why does it vary so much uh, between um securities what what affects Uh, the buying power requirement okay so 
is this a mar- I'm assuming it's a margin account. Is it a portfolio yes. margin account or reg T margin? That's gonna be a difference as well. Because reg T, I think they hold a certain and it's usually something like 20%. So the difference between reg T, reg T is what's called rule rule-based margin. Portfolio margin is what's called risk-based margin. And I'll get to that in a second. Rule-based margin, they usually have some flat amount. And for an ordinary, like a low volatility, like an ETF or typical, I don't know, like a blue chip stock, they're going to hold about 20% of the notional. So a $100 strike is $10,000 of notional, and they're going to hold like $2,000 of margin approximately. For volatile instruments like Tesla, I think that it's broker dependent. They may have some rule where they just hold more margin. And that's just because that's to cover their bases and manage their risk. Uh, They don't want someone blowing out. Portfolio margin, rather than a fixed rule, they basically do a real-time simulation or stress test of, hey, if this security goes up a certain percent or goes down a certain percent, what will that look like in terms of the loss? And that simulation is what drives the margin requirement. And so what goes into the simulation and what affects that can be how long you have to expiration, how close to the money you are. The closer to the money, portfolio margin is going to hold more margin. Out of the money, it's going to hold less because it's, it's less quote-unquote risk. Um, and so that's one reason why there can be differences. And for futures, for example, I believe they hold a certain amount of margin for intraday and then it goes up for overnight. And then when it's intraday, it goes down again. So even the overnight and intraday margin can change. So there's lots of things that go into why different instruments, uh, different volatility, it, it, why the margin requirement can change. And what kind of account you have can also affect that, for example. I see. Um, can we get a good estimate of how much buying power will be needed in the future by changing the strike prices of the option that we're looking to sell short now to see how that impacts buying power. So for example, if a stock's at say 50 and we want to sell say a 30 put um, uh, and we see, oh great, that only requires you know uh, $2,000 of buying power. Um, if we then change the drop down menu to say, oh, what would it cost um, to the buying, what would the buying power be for a at the money put right now, that same security? And we say, oh, look at the buying power went up. Is that is that a good way of determining how much we uh, could need in the future? Or does the buying power needed increase in a nonlinear way, depending on the volatility and day-to-day changes decided by the brokerage? For portfolio margin, you can get some idea. Like you can move it closer to the money, change the expiration. There, I think there are actually tools there where you can tailor the volatility level and you can do like a what if and see how it changes. For reg T margin, I think it's more straightforward. I don't know that you get that much of a change um, by playing around with the strike and expiration, like you said. And for futures, that I believe will also have the same thing because futures, it's, called, it's on what's called span margin, which there is some kind of simulation as well. So... That I'm not as familiar with since I don't trade futures myself, but I do know that futures starts very capital efficient. But if you get close to the money, I know it can expand a whole lot, especially if volatility goes up. Um, but I think it's depending on a broker, some of them have tools where you can simulate the margin as well. Okay, great. We have a question from uh, Nishant. Hi, again, David. Hey. So, the, yeah, the question I had was um, you know, you, since you do mostly tasty trade style trading, it's, a, it's, mostly uh, probability based trading so the question i have is that you know usually stocks go up or down in a price channel so let's say this is two lines stock will go like this you know it will bounce up down up down in a price channel so if you purely look at probabilities and if the stock at is at the top of its trading range and you buy let's say buy or sell atm um, option, it will always show you 50% probability of success. So it completely ignores the fact that this equity might be trading at the top of its trading range and could be vulnerable to a pullback. Do you take that, uh, the charting point of view, do you take that into account any technical indicators in your trading or is it purely probability? 
it's purely probability. Um, now, not to say anything about charting and whether it works or doesn't work, but one thing I want to again point out, for example, like that back test tool I mentioned, where you just sell a systematic put every day, no matter what, no matter where the market is, and it's five delta. That probability is quite accurate in terms of the end of money. If there were some instance of like, if you only sold at the bottom or if you only sold at the top, I feel like that would skew the probability, but I haven't really found anything that in fact does that. And for me, I think it's just a matter of like in the moment, like you can think there's a trend or it's a resistance or support or whatever, but like there's so much else that goes into it. And for me, I'm not going to sit there and try to calculate every single thing, but I just take the price of the option and the delta. Like, I, I feel like there is an efficiency to the market where you you can just go by that purely and have a likely expectation of the outcome from a probabilistic sense. And And I don't have to focus on trying to myself inject some decision making, you know, you know, try to look at the chart. Now you can. And, and and going back to, for example, Ian asked about only selling put a high IV, for example. And that, that's sort of like a technical indicator, right? Volatility levels. I, I feel like there may be, again, at some instance where if you do that, you may have a higher win rate, so to speak. But you may fool yourself into thinking it's better. But in fact, you may just be missing out on other trades that probably would have won anyways, but you're system you're trying to overlay like makes you feel like oh this is suboptimal so i'm going to skip it you know because it's it's at a top a peak so i'm not going to sell because like you think it's at, the stock is at a resistance or iv is low um so for me at least for the systems i've developed i usually find that just taking all the trades and following the rules provides a greater overall pnl even if one metric like the win rate might look better. So it's more focused more on the expectancy overall than necessarily just one, one aspect. Uh, I was curious on what, um, did you have any lessons that you learned and what was your experience in, during the COVID crash of 2020, the spring of 2020, uh, when uh, volatility shot through the roof? So one mechanic that came out of all of that was this idea of credit targeting because we had done systematic trading like you know selling the same delta and using the stops or whatever and that had been fine but iv was so high in covid that we would just get massive premiums which sounds good but then when you get stopped out you just have a massive loss right and so uh, I mentioned this in the podcast where if you have the same win rate as you expect, but just by pure bad luck and sequence, you're stopped out on these large volatility, high premium trades, and you only happen to win the ones that are smaller, that's going to skew the, the PNL because your, your sizing essentially becomes non-consistent. And so the lesson was adding this idea of the credit targeting and size uh, credit is the size credit is the proxy for risk and so i know people like to focus on buying power or contract size i mean those obviously are proxies for risk of course but because in our mechanics the loss is tied to the stop which is tied to the credit right by extension the credit is a proxy for size and so by equalizing that credit uh, you can essentially size your trades consistently from a risk standpoint. That was one of the kind of the major developments that was directly from the experience we had in March of 2020. Mm. Uh, do your um, stop loss, uh, are your stop losses widened during periods of high volatility to kind of um, to reflect the high IV? They are not. We've tested different schemes. None of them seem to be consistently better. But there is one aspect that naturally widens is you're further from the money, 
right? So even if your stop in terms of multiples is the same, you are in fact wider and further from the money when IV is high. And so that naturally gives your trade some more room to breathe, all right? Especially if you believe that high IV means volatility is contracting, right? Volatility is contracting, you have that tailwind. It means if you believe that generally IV is overstated, then yeah, you're further from the money, you have that contraction. That naturally gives your trade a little extra kick in terms of being able to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned uh, in other podcasts uh, that sizing is key. Uh, when you talk about sizing, uh, did you ever look at sizing as a percentage of buying power? And and the buying power, does your buying power fluctuate quite a bit um, trading the index options? As uh, I, I've noticed buying power fluctuates drastically when shorting uh, individual equities. I would not say my buying power fluctuates much. Uh, part of that is because of the stops. If I were to trade, I'm on portfolio margin. So if I were to trade, you know, my typical 15 delta, you know, uh, 90 DTE, the buying power is pretty low. It's like seven to 10% of notional. So that, that's pretty leveraged. Now, if I were to, even though I don't get stopped out, let's say the market just kind of drifts down and I'm, I'm never like showing a big loss and the market just drifts down to my strike by like expiration, that buying power will grow. Because I mentioned for portfolio margin, it, it's taking into account the um, the volatility the, at the moneyness or the moneyness and the, the time left to expiration. But because I do a stop and I also do a profit take, I'm always out of those positions within... 20 to 30 days. And so within that time frame, it hasn't allowed the uh, those situations to change enough that the margin is going to expand on me. So because of the mechanics, that naturally keeps the the margin usage pretty stable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, have you looked into uh, like specific sectors and stocks, highly correlated stocks within that sector that, you know, they could be trading at a much higher uh, IV, maybe more opportunities to capture um, premium, for example, say looking at highly correlated stocks within the oil sector or mining or shipping or something like that. Have you ever um, ventured into looking at any of those type of uh, option plays in that in sectors? I personally have not. It, it, there's been so much research and evolution just within the SPY, SPX and focusing mm -hmm. on the systematization of the strategy. Mm -hmm. Not to say I won't ever explore other markets, but really there, there's been so much and it's still ongoing in the last three years that I, I just never felt a need to explore other markets. Mm -hmm. But I know that like what you mentioned, for example, uh, there's like dispersion trading where like uh, you, you buy, you sell the high IV and the underlying names and buy the uh, low IV and, and the index, for example. Th there's definitely different types of pairs trade or dispersion trade opportunities when you explore the different IV levels um, of individual versus index, right? So I'll definitely say that's that's there, but no, it's not something I, I have personally explored. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, what do you make of this bear market that we've been in for the last uh, year or so and the vix volatility index has been been so low i mean it's been as low as 20 and only briefly getting up to 39 uh, is this a sign of complacency with uh possibly a much more downside risk i don't know if it's a sign of complacency just yet what i've heard and a lot of other podcasts and i listen to people like jim Corson or like chris Cidio and people who like play in the volatility space was it was something like after COVID, right? So before COVID, there was complacency and vol was not bid up because nobody cared to hedge and there was complacency, right? COVID came, everything got, everyone got blown up and then everything got repriced. And then everyone, all of a sudden, everyone wants to hedge, right? So like vol was like consistently high and people were buying hedges and whatever. But as 2021 came in and nothing happened, um, in 2022, people were already kind of hedged. So there was not this rush to like buy puts or whatever. And there was not this uh, immediate bid on, on volatility, which is why like um, volatility didn't spike as much as you would think it did with like a 20% or 25% drawdown. 
And then what happens was there was this reflexivity where like, because volatility didn't pop, hedges didn't work. People were like, oh, okay, hedges don't work. So like, rather than trying to hedge, they started just monetizing like, okay, our puts aren't going to give us this like few hundred percent profit like we thought it was. So when we were chopping this year in like May or June or whatever, the next time vol should have spiked, people started monetizing, selling off their hedges instead because they're like, ah, oh, it's not going to blow up. So we're just going to try to recoup what we can. So that provided further downward pressure on vol. And that's going to be, that's been kind of the, the dynamic of this year. Now, I don't know what the levels are now in terms of like institutional, like hedge, hedging exposure, but like if it gets to the point where like people just don't care or like don't, don't believe in hedging and now they're, they're under hedge, whatever, and we get this reset where that complacency comes back in or they're not positioned and, and there is another large shock, then yeah, we, we could see that downside, the scrambling to hedge because with COVID, um, it's like this forced liquidation, right? There's like this cycle that, uh, that occurs when, when large parties are forced to sell or forced to raise cash that gives that crazy squeeze um, to volatility. And, 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 and because of those dynamics I mentioned, we didn't have that this year, but because we didn't have that this year, that could lead to that, that, that reset or that complacency where it, it could set up to happen again, potentially. Mm. Uh, for players looking to uh, just go long and looking for that uh, great time to enter in to go long, is our high VIX levels, say above 40 or 50 or whatever number, are they a pretty good indication of a, of a good time to get in? Is it worth waiting do you think um, for long only players to wait until the VIX gets really high for capitulation day, if that ever comes? For me, I've never really been one to try and time the market or like, if I'm going to go long, I'm just going to go long and trade around it or hedge it as, as appropriate. So that that's not really an answer I've thought about um, because again, like I tend to more just think, when I say long term, I'm not just talking about like, well, I'm gonna buy and hold forever. Like in that sense, I'm more thinking about I just run strategies that have a positive expectancy, and I just let them run their course, right? And because I have a mix of strategies, I'm not necessarily trying to depend on one to do well. I'm like, okay, VIX is high or the market's down, so this is the appropriate one. I just run multiple strategies. Some do well in some environments, some do well in other environments, but that kind of interwoven effect and the anti-correlation between them hopefully gives my overall portfolio kind of a steady upwards upwards drift in that um, the, the net liquidity. So yeah, I don't I don't really have an answer for that. It, it's not the way I think about it. Like oh, VIX is forty, or we're down twenty percent or thirty percent at certain levels, and here let's go long. Um, I'm, I'm just not one. I don't tend to try and time things in that sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, your strategy is to uh, have your system play out over a period of, of many years and you take the high volatility and low volatility along with it. And uh, over time, uh, you feel confident that um, your strategy will capture um, will capture all of that and get reflected in a long-term uh, play. And, correct. And furthermore, having different strategies that behave differently in different environments will kind of smooth out the overall equity curve. So you don't have one that only does well in a really bullish market or only have one that like only does well in a bearish market, for example. Um, right. So having uh, that long-term expectancy, but multiple different strategy streams that combine. Mm -hmm. uh, so multiple strategies. Uh, did you ever feel the temptation to add a kind of like a short call strategy uh, to your um, short put strategy um, to kind of combine them? I or, have, but mm -hmm. for whatever reason, I haven't found one that really just works. It could be a product of like, you know, they say long-term market has positive drift. So calls just naturally uh, lose more. There's some... Uh, th there's some attribution to the fact of the whole put call skew where for the same delta or the same premium, you kind of have to get closer to the money for a call option. And so when the gaps do happen on the upward, you just tend to get blown up more. But there also could be something where like, because of the way my mechanics are using the hard stops, 
they just don't play nice with the way calls work. And if you're trying to do naked strangles or iron condors, you kind of have to manage them in a different way. Um, so for whatever reason, right, and it's not for lack of trying, I just haven't found something with calls that I felt like was was a value add. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is a graph of just a 90 DTE one. And this is just from 2020. But let me change the sizing. Long term, and when I say long, this is only like a two years or so. This is about 83% win rate. So this is kind of lower than that longer term average. Let me change the sizing. Actually, no, this is fine. So you can see that you can get an equity curve that's still pretty correlated to the market, but you can get lower drawdowns and potentially a higher return. So th this period of time, right, you can see that if you were to size it as I have in here, you know, it's about a 70% return, whereas the market from this point is 15%. And the drawdown was half, right, of the max drawdown. And I like to do these things where I call dynamic studies, where I've taken my live trade log and you can actually just tone it down. Like, let's say I was only trying to target for 5% per year, right? So this will automatically adjust all the sizings. And you'll see this graph has the same shape, but it's just the amplitude is smaller, right? So if I want to run it at this size, right? I have about 5% over this period of time, but my drawdown was also only 5%, right? So that MAR ratio, right? The Kager over the drawdown, it, it's it's still better than the market. And if you take this and you want to combine it with something else, like if you want to have some buy and hold or if you have some other strategy you do, this is what I mean by I'm almost like doing these Lego blocks where like you can take one systematic thing, plug it into your portfolio and add this in or size it up and down, for example. David, is this the is this the portfolio construction you, you mentioned about blending? Um, that's part of it. Strategies. So okay. this is something that I wanted to share that people might find interesting. And this is actually linked. So on my, my trading page, which um, I think you guys have been to, it's actually linked here. It's called the model portfolio. And what I've done is I've taken a number of different, for one, it has the S&P, it has the NASDAQ, it has the Russell, but it has like my theta engine strategy. Um, it has this ETF called DBMF, which I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with like trend following, but that's kind of like alternative investments where people used to have hedge funds where people do trend following with futures in different markets. But there's a ETF now that you can buy that replicates that trend following behavior. I've got my ERA input strategy here as well, but I want to show you something interesting because, and just to show you what this does, if I were to do 100% S&P, if you look at the equity curve, um, wait, there's something here that's throwing it off. Let me get rid of this. Okay. So the line, hang on. <laughs> so somebody was adding a bunch of things. So um, that's why I'm coming. Okay. So you saw there was two lines. Now there is only one line. So I could model that other fund approach that I was showing you earlier, where if I wanted to blend, so let's say instead of 100% S&P, I wanted to blend 50% S&P with 50% NASDAQ. Now this has all the monthly data points. So it assumes you rebalance monthly. So do you see the equity curve is a little bit different now? Now the blue one's higher because NASDAQ did really well in the last decade, but you can see the drawdowns are bigger. Now, if I wanted to take that approach and I wanted to add, so let's go back to 100% S&P. So I, if I have 100% S&P, but I just add a little bit of that theta engine or the 90 DTE, and I'm only trying to get 3% per year, oh, not 30, it's too big, three. Look at this equity curve. Would you mm -hmm. believe this is a result of just adding 3% per year? Now, this is about a 10-year study, but by the end of that time, instead of 171% total return, you have a 251. That, that's a huge spread. And there's actually summary statistics here where you can look at the Kager, the inception of day annualized return. Look, it is in fact, so this is showing you, it's only adding 3% to that annual growth rate, right? So you can go very modest with options in your portfolio construction. And the, all of these stats update dynamically. Now, one thing I was toying with is, let's say I don't want to have that high beta of just buy and hold. And... 
um, I'm going to allocate 50% to this trend following. Actually, let me show you what this trend following ETF looks like. It's not that great necessarily by itself. Over the last 10 years, it's a little lackluster. They do well in volatile years, like this year, for example. But honestly, like this isn't like that great by itself. But the magic is when you blend things together, right? So if I have 50% of this, and let's say I only want to trade 5% target for my theta engine, which is still a small target. And then I'm going to do a podcast episode in terms of explaining the sizing, but this 100% means I'm trading in cash secure. So it's also adding about 5% return per year. Look at this equity curve. Just by doing that blend, do you see how it's like smoother? It goes more, the drawdowns are less. If you look at the statistics, you in fact, uh, compared to S&P, right? Your beta, you only have one third of the beta. Correlation is very low. You have a 13% annual growth rate versus 10. And look at the drawdown graph. Drawdowns are much less. And, and so this has kind of been the next evolution of my research. Whereas last year was very focused on individual option strategies, which I still do. I still want to kind of pave the, you know, pave the way in there. But now pulling back and thinking more from like a portfolio construction standpoint and identifying like underlyings, right? If you want to, let's say you like buy and hold, but now you understand you don't have to go all of it, right? Let's say I only want like 25% of the um, S&P and you can play around with this in 25 Even that, peeling that back a little bit, you can still get a nice curve, right? Without the drawdowns. And so that's kind of been the passion of mine recently. And I mentioned in Tesla yesterday that I'm going to do an episode on this um, because this model portfolio is something I, I built out like recently. But I figured because we had the recording here with the visual, it'd be a nice way to kind of demonstrate. And this is this the, these tools and, and these things are all available on my training page and people can go explore. But like it's meant to be something where it's kind of interactive or dynamic. And as you saw, like somebody was there, you know, doing different things. Um, and I'm always trying to come up with ideas like this and, and tools to help people kind of think about uh, trading and options come from a more holistic standpoint. Great. Thank you very much, David. This is uh, very, um, uh, your visuals uh, put it into context uh, in a very clear manner. Uh, thanks for sharing with us. Yeah, no problem.